Hey you geeks, my big fat formal review of Oathbringer. Without spoilers, I can finally say that I have a complaint about a Stormlight book. I wanted more. Yes, a novel almost the size of The Lord of the Rings, and it wasn't enough. That being said, everything within Oathbringer was excellent. Obviously infused with anime and philosophy. My precious moments breaking, but God's not here and nothing's changing. It hits my sweet spot for quality entertainment. The third book of the series appropriately levels up the competition. Our heroes fight more than mere mortals, and they struggle. Oh, do they struggle. You kind of want to punch them and hug them at the same time, but I just end up yelling curse words on the boulevard. Gotta encourage social distance somehow. That's all I can say without spoilers, so with no further ado, let's break it down. Characters. There are too many major character arcs of this novel that I covered Bridge for in an earlier video. Dalinar. We see a new side of Dalinar in this book. Up till now, the worst thing he's done was dare to be drunk at a feast. I love, winning. I love winnings. Drinks all around. True, he had been told not to be drunk, but he had more than amended for that lasp of judgment when we meet him in the Way of Kings. When Kaladin struggled to trust Dalinar during Words of Radiance, I was like, oh, come on, you assume too much. Now we know. Kaladin was right. Dalinar had been the worst light eyes to ever light eyes. Just comparing his first battle to Kaladin's is enough to make a person kick Dalinar in the spheres. But this is the story of his redemption. And boy, does Dalinar's redemption arc hit the moments of failure, regret, rejection, and atonement spot on. I knew he'd been somehow responsible for the death of his wife, but I thought the Rift would pull an inverse siege of Alcazar. Surrender or we'll kill her. Dalinar would never surrender. Never give up. Never give up. Never surrender. Never surrender. But that would have made him far too sympathetic. Instead, he pulls an Olga of Kiev, who burned the village to the ground after it had surrendered. Actually, he's a bit more sympathetic than her. But like her, Dalinar finds the truth and becomes a better person. Shallan. When we left Shallan, she dissolved into a heap of blubbering emotions. Now she needs to find her way back to the brilliant young woman she'd once been, or rather grow beyond that while in a haunted tower, then a haunted city. No wonder she breaks down into three personalities. This is the first time I'd read about a person with actual multiple personality disorder. Often we see... To continue a bad analogy, I think Vale is Shallan's Gollum. She's hot for that sweet, sweet passion, works with the ghost bloods, and fails in every conceivable way to secure the Oath Gate. You had one job. There was no way Robin Hooding around Kolinar would get her onto the Oath Gate platform. If it hadn't been for wit, the whole thing would have ended in disaster. Well, it ended in disaster anyway, and maybe it would have been better if Shallan had owned her failures up front. And yet, I can't be too angry at her. Even Vale isn't all bad. Shallan was trying and eventually succeeds to get a hold of herself. Z. Having read a little on multiple personality disorder, I believe on Earth it's a sign of mental health to hold a conference with the various personalities. So I'll take her ending on Roshar is a sign of mental stability. I'm happy that Shalon is finally at peace with herself over killing her mother, but she is not confronted that Kaladin killed Helleran. That's still shoved behind her wall. 
overcoming that is going to be just great. Adolin. Watching him come to terms with the fact that he is no longer the most powerful man in the room was beautiful. As an Alethi, he conflates power with importance, so he thinks himself relatively insignificant. Each of you is so amazing and so special, and I'm not. I'm just the guy in the group who's regular. But we know that without him, Kaladin and Shallan would still be stranded in Kolinar emotionally wrecked. Kaladin and Adolin have the start of a beautiful friendship. Umba, this could be the start of a beautiful acquaintance. But it's really just a start. They don't talk on page until part three, over a thousand pages from their last conversation in Words of Radiance, when Cal was still being passive-aggressive because Adolin was a light-eyes. We know that Cal has gotten over that, but we never see the two interact as equals in functioning Alethi society. Dysfunctional Alethkar does not count. Adolin was also willing to step aside for Shaladin, which is sweet, but I'm relieved that Shallan knew it was a bad idea. While it's surely to his credit that Adolin trusts Shallan in this, it would have been nice if he and Kaladin shared a drink or something to celebrate Adolin's wedding. Nothing too sentimental, they're a lefty men after all, but a toast can say a lot without saying anything at all. Lastly, Sadius's murder did give Odium an army to attack Thalen's city. Although Adolin hasn't personally been reprimanded for his actions, I have faith Sanderson will finish this off. He brought back the sword throw, he can bring back this. But really, in comparison to his father, Adolin's record remains practically spotless. Also, his trial would be under Alethkar's new monarch. Yasna. No one talks about how freakishly unbalanced and paranoid she is in this book. Unlike her brother, she hides it well. And unlike her brother, she has good reason to be paranoid. Being the Colin family godfather for the past decade has given her quite a few enemies. Ritzi, do you renounce Satan? <laughs> Between that and killing the thieves in the alley, I'm sure she'll hold Adolin responsible. But she does have a crazy streak. She actually considers killing Renarin, seeing him as a threat, while overlooking that Odium was actively courting Dalinar. It's a good thing she stopped herself. That the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. Because if she'd gone through with it, she would have been the biggest threat to the family. Dalinar, Adolin, Navani, and Kaladin would have never forgiven her. And Team Honor would have been down a radiant. Renarin. Goes from creepy and annoying to just creepy. I'm so proud. He's always had a good heart. But the residual awkwardness and carrying around a corrupted spread has made him difficult to get along with other people. He really needs an Eddie or someone to notice when he's weirder than normal. Wait, wait, wait. Did you have a vision? If I had a nickel for every time Renarin had a vision and no one noticed, I could have leveled up my Kickstarter contribution. Venley. Our newest Radiant! Last book, I would have put her down for Villainess Extraordinaire. But with Dalinar setting precedent, her betrayal of her people is small fries. Her story is a classic case of getting everything you've ever wanted and not being happy. And give that joy! Venley has chosen something new, and no one knows how it will turn out. Caliban, the most passionate. I think he unlocked Thalen City's Oathgate 
which according to legend could only be opened by the most passionate. Fenn says so in passing, but this is a Sanderson book. Nothing is insignificant. I feel awkward putting him here because his arc isn't finished. His resolution for this book was failure to swear the fourth ideal and failure to defeat Yelignar. Of course, he's grown a lot as a leader, a radiant, and a human being. He was so nice to sell this book, I was so happy. Going toe-to-toe -to -toe with an unmade and eight fused is not easy, yet he was not satisfied. So I can't be satisfied either. Magic system. The Way of Kings and Words of Radiance had made oblique references to the unmade, but these monsters now take center stage. They are problems our heroes can't just stab their way through. It's funny that mythology used to take mental problems and assign them a physical manifestation for the purpose of being able to stab it to solve it. Sure, some stout-heartedness was required, but Sanderson is different. As Lyft, in her now lovable, childlike wisdom, points out, Dalinar wields a book against Odium, and Shallan hugs herself to combat an army. But poor Kaladin takes on Yelignar with a shard blade. We don't understand Yelignar yet. As Sanderson says, the better a magical entity is explained, the more satisfying its payoff is. No one, least of all Kaladin, knows what a Yelignar is. We barely saw his glow in Kolinar, though epic Kaladin's fight was anticlimactic. It was 1980's Team USA's pre-Olympic game with the Russians, where they lost. Soviet Union rubbing Team USA 10 to 3. They had to lose to know how to win. Now that Kaladin's lost, he better learn how to win. Contrast this to the Thunderclast, which is described in the first page of the whole storming archive. We see it in Dalinar's vision, then it hurls a boulder in the Siege of Kolinar. We also know it's comparable to a chasm fiend. On top of that, humans have a general idea of what giant rock monsters look like. Oh, darn. Oh. <laughs> All of this is why Adolin's fight and technical loss is so satisfying. That and his growing, dare I say, a bond with Maya? If he revives her, would he still have a shard blade? World religion. I have no problem reading about fantasy worlds with dead gods. I even appreciated Dalinar's debate of tradition in religion. The traditions I grew up with were, like his Takuma rap, only a few generations old. But every time someone said God is dead, My God's not dead, he's surely alive. No! Annoyed the snot out of me. I hate that song, I hate the movie, I hate that it interrupted Dalinar and Kadash's debates. World building. Ah, now we come to why I've put off making this review. I live in the Twin Cities and read Oathbringer during the George Floyd riots. Sirens blaring, Huey's flying over, and I'm like, Let, let's check in with Bridge Four. I must say, Sanderson nails riots. Publicly kill an innocent? Check. Immediate violent outrage? Check. Citizens barricading their homes, a surreal sense of unease and anxiety setting in. Check and check. Fortunately, we Twin Cityites did not have an unmade or a cult move in. But I can now say from experience that Sanderson perfectly conveys a city on the brink 
of utter chaos. Plot. I would have thought that Dalinar's mission to unite the Radiance would have involved more boulder carrying a la Way of Kings and less I just want to tell you both good luck. We're all counting on you. That being said, watching him try to unite the world was fun. Queen Fen is perfect for calling Dalinar out on his creme. Out of wisdom or pure dumb luck, Dalinar at least had the good sense to send Shallan, Adolin, and Elikar on a life-changing misadventure with Kaladin. Though I think only Adolin got something good out of it. Elikar almost did, then Moash. That Kremlin? Krem is really too good a word for him because Krem is of honor. However, the word I'm searching for, I can't say because there's preschool toys present. Now, I've hated Moash since he killed Syl. She got better, but Elikar did not. And that was awful. Not just for Elikar, but Gavinar, Alethkar, and worst of all, Cal. His struggle to decide what is right is the driving question of this series, and Moash does not help. Nor do the unmade, the giant evil spirits who haunt the city of walls and secrets, want to kill our heroes and strands them in the desert, complete with giant fungi. It's a giant mushroom. Maybe it's friendly! Someone should have gotten Azure hyped on cactus juice. Because part four was dark. Dalinar got his coalition together just in time to remember he had burned his wife to a crisp. Finally sobering up, he returns to lead his coalition only for Taravangian. You speak in the brain. One is a genius, the other's insane. To inflict the revelation of the original Voidbringers. They were human. Killers at the core. I finally saw a Sander twist coming. A note in Elantris's Ars Arcanum talked about humans traveling throughout the Cosmere. So when the Elastaly revealed that humans weren't native to Roshar, I was more surprised that the Alethi didn't know that. The Iriali did. Maybe that's why they sided with the Void. Speaking of Odium, he makes a good argument for why he's not evil. He cares for people. He gives them what they want. He takes their pain and enslaves them with it. Life is pain, Highness. Anyone who says differently is selling something. Emo Jackie was thrilled to see Dalinar accept pain and responsibility for his actions. A strong life decision and will hopefully unite the Radiance now that they know none of them have screwed up as much as Dalinar. Beyond uniting realms, that was Dalinar's true quest and in that he has finally taken a first step. Thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe if you would like to see more. Your patronage is greatly appreciated.